Chapter 14 Nest I slept. The ship filled all through the night, and even in my dreams, I could sense it. I could feel her shifting on the sand as she became lighter, and at some point she came free of the ground and was floating again. Air moved beneath her belly once more, and in my sleep I soared all around her. I waited for my father, but he did not come. I was only half-dressed when Baz burst into the cabin. Oh, thank heavens, he puffed when he saw me. What's wrong? Kate DeVry has gone missing. I nearly fell over, one leg in my trousers, staggering around the room. I thought she was locked in. Baz couldn't keep a smile from pulling at his lips. Apparently, your Miss DeVry is quite determined. She made a run for freedom after drugging her dear chaperone. No! A few too many drops of the sleeping elixir prescribed for Miss Simpkins' tropical headaches. When she finally woke up, Miss DeVry was long gone. She's completely capable of it, I muttered. Quite a future she has ahead of her, your sweetheart. She's not my sweetheart. A criminal mastermind in the making, if you ask me. And what's all this about grave digging? How long she'd been gone? No one knows. Miss Simpkins only woke up about half an hour ago. She got Mr. Lisbon up, and he had all the passengers checked. Bass shook his head. So then the captain got called in, and they wanted to find out if you'd gone off with her again. Oh, no. They wanted you to go to the Takapi stateroom if you were here. I tied my shoes, skipped brushing my teeth, and hurried forward to aid deck, combing my hair with my fingers. I could just imagine Miss Simpkins sitting in an armchair and puffing and fanning herself. When Mr. Lisbon opened the door to the Tupkapi stateroom and let me in, Miss Simpkins was, in fact, collapsed in an armchair, gulping air and fanning herself. The captain looked visibly relieved to see me. Mr. Cruz, he said, I'm very glad to find you aboard. Mr. Hillcock no doubt told you of our missing passenger. Yes, sir. Did you have any prior knowledge of this? None, sir. But perhaps you have an idea where she might have gone? I took a deep breath. Perhaps, sir. Then you shall go find her. I certainly don't approve of that idea, said Miss Simpkins, primly. I think he spent quite enough time alone with Miss DeVry. My face was burning, but I dared not say a word. Any objection I made would only confirm her suspicions and perhaps spread them to the captain. I stood, looking at the floor, furious with Kate for sneaking off like this. Mr. Cruz will not go alone, the captain replied. Mr. Lunardi is off duty. He will accompany him. Just the two of them, protested Miss Simpkins. Surely you can... I can spare no more, the captain said. The ship's repairs are my chief concern. I need all hands here. Mr. Cruz knows the island better than anyone, and I suspect he also has a good idea where to look. He will find her more easily than a team of thirty men. Bring this reckless girl back, Mr. Cruz. Once the ship is airworthy, I plan to depart immediately. Yes, sir. Change into your shore clothes and report to the main gangway at once. I'll have Mr. Lunardi meet you there. The captain was annoyed, and I did not blame him. This business with Kate DeVry, and me too, I suppose, had gone from an annoyance to a danger to the ship. We had already been blindsided by a tropical storm. The captain knew it would be foolhardy to stay any longer than necessary. He did not want to be delayed by a willful young lady with a talent for disappearing into the wilderness. Back in my cabin, I hurriedly changed out of my uniform and rushed to the main gangway. As I stepped down to the beach, I was pleased to see the ship had a good six feet of clearance now. It was just coming on nine o'clock. First light would have been no earlier than six. Kate would not have ventured into the forest before then. At most, she had three hours on me. I knew where she would go. Down into that valley where we'd seen the cloud cat disappear. She thought its nest was there. She'd go there to take pictures. If she could get there. For the first time, I felt afraid for her. She had a terrible sense of direction. She'd get lost. And if she did, what hope had we of finding her? I was about to go back and ask the captain for more men to help us look when I remembered the cave. How she'd asked for the bearings of things. Still, that would be no use without... A compass. My hand darted to my pocket, 
It was not there. My thoughts flew back to the cave when she had handled it. I could not remember taking it back from her, and could not remember its smooth, cool shape returning to my pocket. I had been without it since, and too preoccupied to notice. Kate knew how to follow the stream to the skeleton tree, and from there she might well remember the direction we'd taken as we pursued the cloud cat. That would get her to the bluff overlooking the valley. But how she would descend the slope was another matter, and then when she was down among the trees, would she have the sense to chart a course for herself and keep to it? Bruce Lunardi vaulted down the gangway and smiled uncertainly at me. I understand we're on a rescue mission, he said. I brought some gear. Do you have a compass? I did. Never mind, I've got quite a good one, he said, producing it from his pocket. Lead the way. I still wasn't happy about having Lunardi tag along. I wondered if the captain had done it to placate Miss Simpkins or whether he truly didn't trust me now. The thoughts made me gloomy. He'd sent me off with a chaperone of my very own, just to make sure Kate and I didn't get up to any more mischief. My ears burned at the unfairness of it. Your girlfriend, Baz had called her. They all thought we were off in the forest whispering sweet nothings to each other. I tried to imagine Kate whispering sweet nothing to anyone, and couldn't. I led Lunardi to the stream and then into the forest. So where do you think she's gone? He asked me. Likely she just went off to scribble in her notebook, I muttered, not feeling much like talking. Of all people, why had the captain chosen Lunardi to accompany me? It did seem a bit cruel. Then again, he was off-duty, and he could be spared. The captain wasn't concerned with supplying me with a charming picnic companion. What is it she's so interested in? Lunardi asked. Oh, just the local flora and fauna. She takes photographs too, judging by that camera of hers. She's a keen one for pictures. She should be careful wandering around alone, he said. There might be poisonous snakes about. There's a little red one that jumps, I said. Really? he asked. Deadly, apparently. What nips enough to take down a hippo? I'd stay sharp. You see anything move down there? Sing out. Thanks, said Lunardi, his eyes dropping to the undergrowth. We walked on a bit in silence. It's not really poisonous, I said, feeling badly. But it does have a spring to it. Gave me a fright, I can tell you. He laughed. We walked on in silence. He took a compass reading. In his crisp khaki trousers and shirt, he looked a proper adventurer, like some dashing jungle explorer stepped out of a movie screen. This is something, eh? He said happily. Bit of an adventure. Bit too much, I said. We usually don't get pirates and a shipwreck on every trip. Don't go getting used to it. No, I suppose not, he said with a chuckle. He was quiet a moment, and then he said to me, You're lucky, you know. I looked at him, irritated and surprised all at once. Why do you say that? Because you love what you do, I can just tell. Your whole life you've wanted to work aboard airships, haven't you? Yes. I see you around the ship. Doesn't matter what you're doing, you just look content, like you're doing the right thing. My problem is I can't figure out what's the right thing for me. You don't need to. I said it before I could stop myself. Why do you say that? Because you're rich, I said. You can do exactly as you wish. He looked astonished. No, I can't. My father expects me to help run the family business. That's not what I want. I don't have any interest in that, and I don't have any talent for it either. I'm not at all sure I have a talent for anything. My father's quite disgusted with me. He says I can't stick at anything. So he decided to stick me somewhere himself. You didn't want to go to the airship academy then? I would have given my molars and as many fingers as I could spare for such a chance. Bruce shook his head. My father and I made a bargain. I'd train at the academy and spend two years aboard a ship. And afterward, if I still wanted... He let me try something I chose, providing he approved, of course. And what would you do? That's just it. I don't know yet. There's plenty of things I'm interested in, for a little while anyway, but nothing I've got a passion for. That's why I think you're so lucky. You just know. 
I sniffed. I wasn't as lucky as he thought. Look, they told me what happened, he said. Me getting your place, I mean. Stealing must be how you think of it. And you're right. You earned that position. I'm sorry. It's not your fault, I said uncomfortably. I'd transfer ship if I could, he said, and get out of your way. But my father made me sign a two-year service contract with the Aurora. If I even changed ships, he'd see that as quitting, and he wouldn't give me a chance at anything else. I'd end up working for him at the company for the rest of my life. Why can't you just quit and do what you want? I'd be in disgrace. He'd cut me off without a penny. I'm quite sure of that. You'd just make your own way. A bit scary when I don't know my own way. I'm not like you, Mr. Cruz. I don't have much of a talent for anything. Everyone has a talent for something, I said. I hope you're right. I'm sorry for the trouble I've caused you. I hope you'll not think too ill of me. I couldn't quite understand why he just didn't do what he wanted. But it's easy to give advice to others until you try to imagine yourself in their skin. Going against your father, feeling alone and helpless in the world. These were not easy things to bear. Seems we're stuck with each other for a couple years then, I said. I tried to say it kindly, but could not keep the bitterness from my voice. Perhaps you could transfer ship, he said. I could speak to my... Please don't. But then I wouldn't be holding you back. Why should I change ship? So you could be a sailmaker like you wanted. The Aurora's my ship. Yes, but you can't limit yourself to... She's my home. You should be the one to move. But I just told you I... I know, I know, I said. Let's not talk about it anymore. Let's just find Miss DeVry. We fell into an uneasy silence. I was sorry for my outburst. Bruce was only trying to be kind, but I didn't feel like apologizing. After several minutes, we reached the skeleton tree. Bruce took a compass reading, and we set a course for the bluff where Kate and I had last seen the creature. It was further than I thought, but of course, last time I made the trip, I was running. It drops off up there, Bruce said. We walked to the edge and looked down the slope. I gazed at the treetops, trying to remember exactly where it was we'd seen the cloud cat disappear. I pointed. She'll be down there. How do you know? She wanted to go down there a few days ago, but we ran out of time. She'd have a job getting down there, Bruce said. Oh, she could take care of herself just fine, I said, hoping I was right. It was possible she'd never even made it this far. What if she was lost and bumbling around in the forest? Somehow I doubted it. This was a young lady who could drug her chaperone and steal my compass. While we were together, she might have been secretly taking her bearings the whole time, thinking ahead to when she'd be rid of me. For her sake, I hope this was the case, for if she was lost, we might never find her. I looked both ways along the bluff, trying to guess which was the easiest way down. What do you think? I asked Bruce. This way, he said. I saw no reason to disagree, so we headed northeast along the bluff. Drink? he asked, offering me the canteen. I'd seen it earlier, slung over his shoulder. He filled it at the stream back at the skeleton tree. Thanks. You're all kitted out, I said. I know, he laughed. My mother gave me the compass too before I shipped out. Looks like I should be exploring the Amazonia instead of flying on a luxury liner. Ridiculous, isn't it? Still, awfully useful, I said, grateful for the long drink of cool water. Look at this, said Bruce. There was a fresh slash in the bark of a tree. She's cut a blaze. Good for her, I said. Before long, we came across another blaze, marking a path that ran steeply down the side of the bluff. Of course, it wasn't a real path, only a kind of notch that zigzagged crazily down into the valley. She went down that way, said Bruce, with some admiration. It was no simple feat even for us, and we weren't carrying camera gear. When we were still up high, I took a good look across the valley, for I knew that once we were down among the trees, it would be easy to get lost. I sighted the spot we were heading for and set my mind's compass. 
Bruce, I saw, sensibly took his own bearing. We didn't speak, just concentrated on our footing. The first bit was the hardest, and then it got a lot easier, with plenty of strong branches and vines to grab hold of as we staggered down. The climb back up would be hardest. At the bottom, we paused to wipe sweat from our brow and have a drink from Bruce's canteen. We spotted another of Kate's blazes, showing us the right direction. Should we start hollering for her? Bruce wondered aloud. Probably a good idea. Miss DeVry! he shouted. I added my voice to his. I was glad he was with me. I would have felt odd belting her name out into the wilderness by myself. There was no echo. The sound just disappeared, swallowed up by the trees and the hot, heavy air. I was amazed Kate had had the nerve to come so far alone. I turned back and could no longer see the bluff. The foliage was too dense. Trees and snaking vines and flowers were everywhere. Our voices sent rainbow-plumed birds crashing through the leaves and branches. The sun was well overhead now, the air almost too thick to breathe. Miss DeVry, I hollered. Here, came a pleasant sing-song voice. Bruce and I both looked about and then up into the trees. Up here, Kate said. We walked toward an enormous tree with thick branches, hairy with moss. Resting at the base was a familiar carpet bag with a pink floral pattern. It smelled quite awful. I peered up into the verdant foliage. There, in the highest branches, was Kate, reclining against the trunk, legs swinging. A spyglass hung around her neck, along with a compact camera. In one hand, she held her notebook. If she hadn't been swinging her legs and waving, it would have been most difficult to see her. She was wearing a pair of outlandish emerald green harem pants with sequined cuffs and a reddish-brown tunic. I could see that it was good tree-climbing gear, snug at the ankles, and with no long skirt to tangle her up, and the colors couldn't have blended in better. A real thinker, my Kate. Are you quite all right up there, Miss DeVry? Bruce asked. Perfectly comfortable. The view's fine. You should come up and see. Actually, I said, we were hoping you would come down and return to the ship now. She probably needs help down, Bruce said to me, starting to climb. She doesn't need help, I told him and I certainly didn't want Bruce to be the one to help her. I'll just nip up, he said. What about your head for heights? I said, loudly enough for Kate to hear. I should be all right in a tree, he muttered. I went after him. It was quite an easy one to climb, the branches just the right distance apart. I made sure to outstrip Bruce and reach Kate first. She was perched right near the top. I saw her close the notebook as we neared. She gave me a withering look as if to say, How clever of you to have brought someone else along. What on earth were you thinking? Hello, Miss DeVry, said Bruce. Wonderful to see you again, Mr. Lenardi, Kate said, suddenly the perfect hostess. We were sent to bring you back, I said, by way of explanation. Bruce and I stood on the branch beneath hers, so all our heads were at roughly the same height. I had to give it to her. She'd picked an excellent vantage point. Near the tree's summits, the branches and leaves thinned, as had all those of the surrounding trees. She had a view deep into the forest around us for about 50 yards. See anything interesting? Bruce asked. Plenty, she said. All manner of birds. The vantage point is really quite splendid. I can see that, said Bruce. We should head down, I said. Mr. Lunardi here might get a little woozy from the height. I'm fine, thanks, he said. Kate was all smiles up there in the tree, quite the little actress. You'd never know she was worried about our secret getting out, someone else horning in on her scientific breakthrough. Good job finding your way here, I said. My compass helped you out, did it? It was awfully useful. I did mean to give it back. I'm sure. But I was under lock and key at the time, as you know. Unfortunate. Well, we really should be heading back now. I'm not quite ready just yet, thanks, she replied. You've created quite a scandal back at the ship, I said, losing my patience. I don't see why, she murmured and peered through her spyglass. You drugged Miss Simpkins, I exclaimed. Drugged? 
Honestly, you make it sound so extreme. All I did was give her a dose of her own sleeping elixir. Four drops in her water glass before bedtime. Maybe it was eight. I can't remember. No more than eight. What choice did I have? You weren't about to help me. How else was I supposed to get out? She kept the keys clutched in her fist in a death grip. I knew I'd have no chance of wiggling them out unless she was in a good deep sleep. She's in a terrible state, and the captain is displeased as well. I was being held prisoner. It's probably illegal, not that you seemed at all concerned about my welfare. I rolled my eyes. You are to come back with us immediately. How are you enjoying the island, Mr. Lunardi? she asked, turning her smile on Bruce. Is it not paradisical? It's very beautiful, he replied. He was smiling up at her with a completely contented look on his face. I didn't much care for that look. Not that Kate wasn't striking. In her emerald green harem pants and mahogany blouse, she looked like some exotic bird of paradise. But I didn't see why Bruce had to pick this moment to be all suave and matinee idolish. Really, I'm surprised no one's ever settled here, he said. I half expected him to ask me to fetch them drinks. It's not near anywhere, I said impatiently. It's off all the main trade routes. According to the charts, the nearest sizable island is over a thousand miles away. Still, Bruce said, it seems to me someone could live here quite comfortably. Perhaps your father might buy it for you as a vacation home. Shall we head down now? Kate turned to me. I'm not leaving until I get pictures. Pictures of what? Bruce asked. We are out of time, I told Kate. The captain wants to leave as soon as possible. Then this is my last chance, isn't it? I want to get a good, clear shot of her. Her? Bruce said. Ah, so you're happy to share your little secret with Mr. Lunardi, are you? I said to Kate. We're allowed to tell now. What secret? Bruce demanded. Kate looked at me, immensely pleased with herself. I found her nest, she said. Some kind of rare bird? Bruce asked impatiently. Where? I said. She pointed. Do you see it? I followed the line of her finger deeper into the trees, not exactly sure what it was I was looking for. Branches, flowering vines, leaves and fronds getting thicker and darker the farther my gaze ventured. It's just trees, I said. Kate pulled the spyglass from around her neck and passed it to me. Keep looking, Mr. Crow's Nest, she said. Eyepiece pressed tight, I adjusted the focus. It still looked like nothing extraordinary, and I felt my impatience with Kate rekindle. Then I noticed a strange weave of branches. They'd not grown together naturally, not those. It looked as if many small pieces of branch had been carefully arranged into a kind of screen. And there were feathers woven into it too, of all different colors, and bits of sod and clumps of leaves. I was just seeing the screen from one angle, but it seemed that it continued around in a full circle. A high-walled nest, unlike anything a bird would build. More like the nest squirrels build for winter. It looked as if it might even have an overhang to keep out the rain. I noticed too that the windbreak was angled against the prevailing winds. I lowered the spyglass. She built that, Kate said. Why would she make a nest, I said. Birds make nests to lay eggs in. Squirrels make them for winter. She needed a place to live, Kate said. It's incredible, really. She's not a land mammal. She started with no experience, but instinctively she's thought to make herself a kind of shelter. She's smart. Do you mind if I take a peek? Bruce said, reaching for the spyglass. Before he could put it to his eye, something happened. Something long and cloud-colored appeared in a distant tree. I saw the flare of a wing. Kate fumbled her camera to her face, but the cloud cat was already moving again. She leapt away into another tree, her amazing wings flashing open, and I heard Bruce gasp. I probably gasped too, but it was still a surprise to me, the way the creature suddenly became huge and glorious and powerful in that one second its wings spread. And then they folded up again, and she touched down on another branch, and swiftly glided among the foliage, and then disappeared behind the wall of her nest. Kate exhaled loudly through her nose. Missed it. I wasn't ready, she said crossly. 
You two got me all distracted. I looked at Bruce. He was staring, his whole body hunched in the direction of the cloud cat. His mouth was open. I've been waiting all day for it to come back, Kate said. You hollering through the forest probably didn't help. What on earth is it? Bruce said, his voice dry. We don't have a name for it yet, Kate told him. It's a cloud cat, I said absently. Kate looked at me. That was the name I thought of, too. She smiled. We thought the same thing. <laughs> I thought it would be too unscientific for you. No, it's the first thing that leaped into my head. It's some kind of giant bird, is it? Bruce asked. No, it's a winged mammal, Kate told him. You have seen it before? Once, yeah, I said. Obviously, we weren't bothering to try to hide this, which was a relief. I couldn't really see the point of pretending anymore. Kate had her spyglass to her eye again and was peering at the nest. She's in there. I can see her moving. But I can't get a clear shot from here. How did you find the nest? I asked. Luck, mostly. I figured she would live somewhere around here, so it was just a matter of finding a good waiting place. Around her tree, the one her nest is in, there were a lot of debris on the ground. Bird bones, wings, beaks, fish heads. She must pick them out of the water from the bank of the stream or lake, or maybe she glides over. Incredible. She's an omnivore. She eats fruit, too. I saw some mango pits and coconut shells. She must carry them up and smash them to pieces on a rock. Quite a varied diet. Seems to like fish the best, though. She opened her notebook to write something down, and I saw it was filled with jottings and little sketches she'd made. This is amazing. Bruce said. That's why I need a good, clear photograph, said Kate. It'll have to wait, I told her. Look, I probably have one by now if you and Mr. Lunardi hadn't come yodeling along and scared her off. You owe me a photo at least. I was about to tell her I didn't owe her anything, but Bruce said, Have you seen it fly? Her, said Kate firmly. And no, she can't fly. She's crippled, we think. Who knows about this? The three of us, Kate said, and we'd like to keep it that way if you don't mind. This is going to send the scientific world into a furor, Bruce said. Do you think so? Kate said, please. Absolutely. No one's ever seen anything like this. You've made a huge discovery here. You'll want to come back to make a proper study. Ideally, said Kate. My father funds a lot of scientific research, you know, Bruce said. Does he? This is exactly the kind of thing that would spark his interest. He's a keen collector, especially of freakish oddities. I felt a stab of indignation. Oddity. I didn't like that word. The cloud cat wasn't an oddity. She was a real animal, one that was meant to fly, only couldn't because of a mistake at birth. My father keeps a whole wing of one of our houses as a kind of museum. All sorts of taxidermy and so forth. I looked at Kate hoping she'd object, but she was just nodding, listening, swept up in the promise of glory. If your father's after a hunting expedition, this isn't it, I said angrily. No, no, I just meant he's interested in all sorts of things. He could set you up with a proper expedition, you know. Do you think? Kate asked, enthralled. Absolutely, with lots of equipment and experts. I wouldn't want to be shuffled out of the way, though, Kate insisted, her nostrils narrowing just a touch. Of course not, Bruce said. We'd make it a condition. Bruce couldn't stop talking. His enthusiasm was like a big balloon that was stealing all the air from mine. I didn't mind so much that he'd seen the cloud cat, but I did mind that he'd stolen something that, hours before, had belonged just to Kate and me. He'd stolen our discovery, just like he'd stolen my position aboard the ship. Well, that's all grand, I said. Everything's taken care of. You'll all be famous, but right now, we need to get back to the ship. I still need a picture, Kate insisted. It would have been nice if Bruce had echoed my wishes, but he wasn't doing anything. He was peering through Kate's spyglass at the cloud cat's nest. He seemed quite happy to let me continue in the role of party pooper, and suddenly I was extremely angry. No, I said to Kate. You're coming back now. I'll carry you kicking and screaming if need be. You wouldn't. I would. You couldn't. I could, and I will. There's two of us here, and we're acting on Captain Watkins' express orders. 
Kate fluttered her fingers dismissively. I don't believe for a second someone of Mr. Lunardi's breeding would pick up a struggling lady and lug her around like a sack of rice. Would you, Mr. Lunardi? she said, smiling as if they'd shared some wonderful cozy secret. I certainly wouldn't, no, he said, still peering through the spyglass. My heart was pounding, my voice shook. Lunardi, we take orders from our captain, not from some spoiled girl. I resent that, said Kate. You know, Bruce said, looking over to me, this really is an amazing thing she's discovered here. Yes, and with your father's help, she'll come back again. You'll come again. I'll come again so I can serve you all lemonade. But right now, we need to go. I need a photograph, said Kate. I need the proof. When all this started, you were happy with the bones and the photographs of the skeleton. Yes, but if I can get pictures of her, I can get into any university I want. I can head an expedition. I thought you just wanted to see what your grandfather saw. Beautiful creatures. Now you want to be famous. That's not fair, she said hotly. You think I'm being selfish, don't you? That I'm rich and have nothing but choices. I'm a girl, and girls don't get choices. No one's going to give me a chance unless I force them to. It's not enough to be smart and curious. It's just like you being poor. You and I have to try harder and be better to get ahead. I have to have something amazing like this before they'll pay attention to me. No one said anything for a moment. She's right, you know, said Bruce. Terrific, I said. So touching when the rich stick together. It's a huge scientific breakthrough, Bruce said again. I suppose disobeying orders means nothing to you, I said. Why would it? It is this job, and you can always just get your father to find you another. Don't mind that you're getting me into trouble, too. You go back, then, he said. I'll stay with Miss DeVry. That made me even angrier, the thought of her alone with Bruce while they took their pictures of the cloud cat. My cloud cat, not just Kate's. Stay, Matt, please, said Kate. She looked anxious, but I wasn't sure if it was genuine or simply a face she put on to keep me here. I promise it won't take long. I've got a bit of a plan. What's that? To lure her out into the open. Up here, I'll never get a clear shot, especially with her moving around the way she does. But if I could get her on the ground, it might be easier. She'd be slower, and the camera would be steady. I brought a tripod. How would you lure her out? I brought some food. You brought some food? A fish, actually. The cook set their catch out on the beach, and I nabbed one as I was heading off. There was no way I could get anything out of the kitchen. There were too many people around. But I didn't think they'd miss just one fish. It's a nice big one she said enthusiastically. I left some money for it. They'll appreciate that. Where's this fish? <clears throat> All wrapped up in the carpet bag. That explained the smell. I wrapped it up in leaves as well as I could. It's probably good and stinky by now. She'll smell it instantly. You're going to lure her out into the open with the fish? She nodded. And you'll be hiding nearby with your camera, ready to take her photograph. I won't use the flash this time. That would just scare her off. We take a picture, or two, and then it's back to the ship. Lickety-split. She was a planner. You couldn't fault her there. Seems sound to me, Bruce agreed. I don't like it, I said. What if she sees us? She might be dangerous. Kate looked amazed. Her? She ran from us, remember? She's a wild animal. She's gentle as anything. Isn't it obvious? She's shy. Why not just set a little saucer of milk out for her? Kate looked at me. I'd like to get on with this if you don't mind, Mr. Cruz. We are expected back at the ship. Sorry to hold you back, I said, and saw that her eyes were smiling at me. Half an hour, that's all, she promised. I nodded. Let's get down from here and find a good place to take this photograph.